Thanks so much for being here. My name is Tara Nassett. I am a registered dietitian, and I've been asked to speak to everyone about um, starting solid foods with your baby, and then um, as they grow, how to introduce new foods. And I'm really excited. It's a topic I'm super passionate about. I actually have a, a three-year-old, almost four, and a one-year-old, one-and-a-half-year-old myself. So I'm very much in, in the weeds with you guys. Um, but on top of that, I am, like I said, a registered dietitian um, in Chicago. Clinically, I've spent my career working in diabetes and obesity um, with adults. So obviously not uh, this exact topic. Um, but it really is what inspired me to um, become an expert in this topic because the types of diseases that I'm working with adults on are so hard to reverse. But if we started with kids, if we got kids passionate about real nutritious food from the beginning, um, we could really avoid a lot of these preventable metabolic diseases. Um, and so that's what shifted my area of interest and my area of research and culminated in me writing actually a book um, called Healthy Little Foodie, which is available on Amazon. Um, and this book is geared towards parents who have uh, newborns or maybe they're pregnant um, and they uh, or older, all the way up to about two or three years old. And it talks a lot about what to feed your kids, but also a lot about how to feed your kids. Um, because so much of creating um, what we might call a good eater um, is about the, the methods you use um, in addition to just what, what you feed. Um, but today we're going to be talking a lot about the what, but also some of the how. Um, and so let's see. Uh, real quick before I get started, if, if you guys do want to connect, I'm on Facebook, but not really. Instagram is where I do most of my programming. Um, and so I would encourage you to follow me at tara.nasset.nutrition on Instagram. And you can certainly, um, if you think of a question, or maybe you're not watching this live, uh, you could certainly send it to me um, in the direct messaging there. And I'll definitely get back to you. So getting started. All right. When we talk about feeding babies, the first thing we have to always think about is something called signs of readiness. So you do not want to feed a baby before they are biologically ready to be fed. And the tricky thing here is I do think that there is some bad advice out there. Some of it's old wives tales, some of it's just out of date pediatricians, but I hear a lot of people feeding babies too young. Um, and so the true sign of readiness that you're looking for is the ability to sit up straight in a high chair. So this does not mean they can pull themselves into a sit on the floor and just sit there for 10 minutes. Um, they're probably not there yet. Um, but it does mean that in a supported high chair, they're not kind of like slouched like this or like leaning really weird. They should, when strapped in, be able to pretty much hold their core upright. Um, and on that note, I do recommend high chairs that allow babies to sit very vertically. Um, you would never eat like this, right? You would like throw for yourself. So why we put babies in high chairs that are very reclined, I'll never understand. So you want a nice upright seated position. And the reason for this is a lot of it is a choking situation. We want a nice straight trachea so that they can swallow properly in esophagus. Um, but a lot of it is also um, just, it's kind of proof that they're probably biologically ready in other ways. They have the gut enzymes, they can digest the food properly. So two things I like to point out that are not signs of readiness that I hear all the time. One is grabbing for your food. I know, babies grab for your food, it's adorable. We think, oh, he wants my food. Um, but babies grab for everything, right? That's just what they do, you know? They grab for toys, they, they grab your hair, they grab your jewelry, and they grab your food. But that does not mean that they're ready for eating food. The other one is that they're not sleeping through the night and maybe you're thinking food will keep them full for longer and let them sleep longer. Um, that's definitely a myth. Not only does it not really work, it actually could... Um, work against you. If their gut is immature and not able to digest the food well, um, they might end up with more gas, more discomfort, and actually could wake up more. 
So don't let someone trick you into the whole stick some rice cereal in their bottle at four months and it'll keep them asleep. That is definitely a myth. Um, so when it comes to options for beginning, because now let's say you, your kid is ready. They're sitting up in their high chair. They're ready. Um, you know, you've got two main options that are well known. One is purees and one is baby led weaning. Um, I don't really think there's a one or the other here. Um, you can definitely do a mix of purees and larger chunks of food. If you're not familiar with baby led weaning, the idea is that kids can feed themselves at a really young age. And of course, kids, a six month old can't feed themselves a puree. So people will give like stick shaped food. Um, a good example would be like a, um, a meatball that they've made kind of elongated. Uh, so the kid can kind of gnaw on it um, and eat as best they can. It's not for everybody. And like I said, it's not all or nothing. Depending on what makes sense, what you guys have in the house, what the other family members are eating, you might do some purees and some chunks of food. The thing is, if you are doing chunks of food, they do need to be cut properly. And I would strongly recommend looking into um, baby led weaning resources and books um, so that you understand fully how to safely give larger chunks of food to a six month old. It can be done right, but it can also be done wrong. And that could be a, a choking hazard. Um, but, let, but as far as purees, that's a little bit more comfortable for a lot of parents, right? It's less chance of choking, um, pretty easy. A little bit more work on your part in the sense that you have to sit there and physically hand feed them. Um, and then also, if you are interested in making homemade food, purees are just a little bit more complicated to make because you have to whip out a blender or a food processor. Um, whereas with baby led weaning, you might be able to give them what you are having for the meal. Um, so it's really kind of up to you nutritionally and scientifically. Both are good methods and, and you can do both. You don't have to stick with just one. But thinking about timing of the meals, when we're talking about a six-month-old baby just starting to eat, I usually recommend you pick two meals a day, either breakfast and lunch, breakfast and dinner, lunch and dinner, breakfast and dinner, just two. Um, you know, it's already, you're already still feeding that baby so many times. Um, they're probably still nursing or taking bottles quite a few times a day. So, um, adding in too many feeding sessions, not necessary and a lot of work on your part. Um, but we do want to get them comfortable with food. So two times a day is a, is a good, happy medium. Um, so then the next question of course is what should we feed them? And, you know, is it different if we choose purees and is it different if we choose baby led weaning? Um, and the answer is not really. There is one key nutrient that we're in search of at this six month age, and that is iron. So iron is in the baby from their mother's stores. And so they store up iron that lasts them about six months. And around six months, they need to start getting it from food. And so that is the number one priority when we start feeding at six months. In all reality, a six-month-old baby is not going to take in a ton of volume of food. So it is important that the foods that you give them have this essential missing nutrient. Um, probably the most well-known iron food in baby world is iron-fortified cereals, um, which is sort of a, a bummer to me because... If you think about it, first of all, they're iron fortified cereals, right? They don't actually have any naturally occurring iron. The manufacturer adds iron into it. Um, so it's sort of a strange choice to choose a food that does not naturally have iron in the first place. Um, and then beyond that, it, there's this concern about arsenic, which you've, which you've probably seen in the news recently, as well as other heavy metals. A lot of these um, heavy metals and arsenic are highly concentrated in rice, especially, but um, also all grains. And so giving a tiny, tiny, tiny baby a food that even if it's just marginally contaminated can have an impact on their little, little body. Um, so altogether, I, I strongly feel that rice, especially, is not a good choice for a first food. It does not naturally contain iron and it may be harmful. Um, so I would not recommend that. 
Um, there are other cereals like oatmeal and mixed grain baby cereals that are fortified with iron. But I would challenge people to rethink the cereal idea, um, again, because it's not a natural iron food. And instead, focus on foods that contain iron naturally, partly because these foods tend to have a more absorbable type of iron called heme iron. And so you, the baby does not have to eat as large of a volume of the food to get as much of the iron. And like I said, they're not taking in a lot of volume at six months, and that's okay. Most of their nutrition is still coming from milk or breast milk or formula. Um, so we don't want us parents to stress out, oh, they only had two bites today. That's fine if those two bites were super nutrient dense. And so that's where the naturally occurring iron foods come in. Now, if you're hardcore, you want to just be like super nutritious mom and dad, the best rec I have is actually liver. Now, a lot of people think, oh my God, I hate liver. That smells disgusting. I won't do it. And that's fine. You don't have to feed your baby liver. But if you don't mind it, if you like it, if you have a source of good quality grass-fed beef liver or some organic chicken liver, um, liver is an unbelievable source of iron. And uh, your baby really does not have to eat much of it to get the iron that they need, which is just a lot of pressure off of you to feel like, oh, they didn't eat enough today. Um, if you don't want to, if you do want to do liver, I have some recipes in my book um, and you can certainly Google as well. Um, but basically you're looking to do like a liver puree, essentially a pate. Um, if you don't want to do liver, that's fine. You could also do any sort of beef is going to be a real powerhouse for iron. So you could do, if you're doing baby lead weaning, you could do things like the beef meatballs. If you're doing purees, you can um, slow cook a roast in your crock pot and then throw that into a food processor with some beef broth and puree that down until it's a consistency that your baby likes. Um, and so that's, those are both great options for getting really power packed with the iron. Um, chicken and turkey also has some iron. So um, that's definitely an option. And then salmon and sardines have a lot of iron, um, not as much as the meat, but a fair bit, plus they're, they're very nutritious foods. Um, for all of these, the same thing applies. If you're doing baby lead weaning, you need it to be very flaky, very easy to gum, very easy to chew, and something that the kids can hold. So like a, a stick of fish, not a fish stick, but you know, like if you cut the fish into like long strips and then saute it, that would be a suffice. And then if you're doing purees, you could honestly, my book has a recipe that you just toss a can of wild caught tuna into your food processor with a little bit of yogurt, plain yogurt and lemon juice. And you make like a little baby tuna salad um, and it's delicious and uh, kids actually love it. Um, so lots of ways to do purees with meat. I know it doesn't, people don't think of it uh, usually. And then they also sell meat purees in the baby food section. So take a look at those. Um, we did mostly homemade baby food for my kids, but not entirely. Um, we did do some of the store-bought stuff, and especially with, like, the pouches, my absolute priority, I never bought a pouch that didn't have meat in it because I just, that's what they need. The fruit and vegetables is nice, and we'll talk about that, but they need the iron. They need the meat, um, and so I always would buy the ones that had some some amount of meat in them. Um I obviously am a proponent of meat and I don't generally recommend babies being vegetarian and, or, or vegan. Um, but that being said, there are some plant sources of iron. It's not as good as the animal sources because they have a different type of iron that's harder to absorb. Um, but they do have some. Chickpeas and red kidney beans have some. Um, you can puree those. Or you can make them into like a, like a cake, almost like a, a bean burger, and then make that into strips for a sort of baby led weaning option. Um, and then believe it or not, potatoes have a little bit of iron. So again, you could make a nice thin mashed potato. Um, there's a recipe for that in my book as well. Um, or you could um, make it into like a potato cake, um, that sort of thing. So definitely some options that are not meat or animal based, um, but the meat is gonna pack a much bigger punch when it comes to um, iron. I do wanna debunk one myth about starting solids that I think I hear way too much, which is that you can only introduce one food every three days or some variation on that. That just isn't true. Um, it, it actually is not rooted in any research uh, of any kind. So basically you can give 
any food at any time. The exception being honey. Um, honey, we do recommend that you wait till one year because it has a risk of botulism and um, uh, younger babies just can't bite that. So um, hold off on the honey. But other than that, there's not actually any reason you can't introduce two foods, three foods, a full family recipe. There's no reason why you can't take your family's enchiladas and throw them in a blender and serve them as a puree to a six month old. I, you can. Um, the one caveat, of course, is allergens, which has been a very confusing topic in the last 10 years or so. Because at one point in time, we were hearing, hold the allergens till the baby's older, so that if they do have an allergic reaction, they can, it'll be less severe, or they can tell you they're having it, or you know they're just older and they can tolerate it better. Uh, but that actually has been recently shown to increase the incidence of allergies. Instead, they are now the American um, Pediatrics are still are now recommending that you give the allergens early, almost right away. Um, if you actually have a family history of allergies, you might want to work with an allergist right off the bat. They may even want you to give small trace amounts younger than when I'm saying you should start solids um, as a way to get them to not react. That's that's go to an actual allergist for that. But for a no family history of allergies, um, the general recommendation is right around six months, seven months, start offering the allergens. The top allergens, um, if you don't know, are wheat, soy, eggs, milk, nuts, peanuts, fish, and shellfish. And so um, it's recommended that they get all of those within the first two months or so of when they start eating. Um, if you're concerned, then one good thing you can do is only serve one of those at a time when they're new. So if that makes sense. So when you're going to serve fish for the first time and you also have never served dairy, don't serve fish and dairy in the same meal because if they do have a reaction, we don't know if it's to the fish or to the dairy. But that doesn't mean you can't serve fish on Tuesday and then dairy on Wednesday and then now we've knocked out two groups. So you just might want to split the allergens up when they're new. Um, if you've already served yogurt and it went well, and then you want to make a fish puree with yogurt in it, that's fine. Because if they didn't react to the yogurt the first time, they're presumably not going to react to the yogurt the second time. And if they do react, it's the fish. So hopefully that makes sense. Um, another thing, if you're, if you're really nervous about it, is consider offering new allergens at breakfast because most six or seven month olds will not be taking a nap right after breakfast. Um, so that'll give you a minute to like see if they're reacting instead of putting them to sleep and then worrying about not being able to see it if they're having a reaction. So that's another thing you can do. But in general, there's absolutely no reason to serve one thing at a time. Who eats like that? That's very weird. And if anything, it's setting your baby up to have a very bland palate. Um, and so Healthy Little Foodie has recipes that all have lots of flavors in them. There's herbs, there's spices, there's balsamic vinegar, there's, um, there's all sorts of things, lemon juice, tangy things. Um, we want babies to experience these flavors and not just eat plain steamed squash or something. Um, yeah, I had a question to repeat the allergenic foods. So again, I just want to clarify, technically you can be allergic to any food that contains protein. Um, so there are recorded allergies to countless foods, but the, no, the top eight allergens in the US are as follows. Wheat, soy, eggs, milk, nuts, peanuts, fish, and shellfish. So those are going to be the most common things that, that kids might react to, which that list probably makes sense too. You probably know people or kids with some of those allergies. Um, and so, yeah, that's the ones you want to be on the lookout for. But at the same time, that you really do want to introduce quickly, early. And um, in my book, all the puree recipes incorporate various allergens to help parents find ways to kind of sneak them in. So for example, I have a recipe recipe for a squash puree that has some walnuts blended in with it, which tastes good because nuts and squash go great together, but is also a way for you to expose a little one to tree nuts. So 
Awesome. Okay, so we talked about iron foods. My rule is, remember we said we want you to feed a newer, a younger baby twice a day, either breakfast, lunch, breakfast, dinner, lunch, dinner. At each time you feed them, one of those iron foods should be present. Okay, so meat, um, salmon, sardines, chickpeas, kidney beans, potato, one of those should be there. Then I always like to have parents also serve a fruit or a vegetable. I recommend prioritizing vegetables because babies don't seem to mind them the way toddlers sometimes do. So um, it's a good chance to get those flavors in early. Um, on top of that, pretty much all babies love fruit. It's very easy to get them to love fruit. Um, that's a slam dunk. I don't think you have to worry about not exposing them to fruit enough and, and then you might not like it. They're probably going to like fruit. Um, regardless, vegetables or fruit, variety, variety, variety. So, um, you know, what you do one day, do something different the next. Or if it's easier from a purchasing standpoint, maybe do a week of two of them and then the next week buy something different. Um, but whatever works for you, try to get variety. And then the other thing that people always overlook when it comes to fruit and vegetables is fat. So fat is critical for babies and toddlers and honestly all people, but especially young, young, growing, brain developing babies and toddlers. So what I like folks to do is make sure when you make a vegetable or a fruit puree, you put fat in the puree. This is not the case with store-bought purees, and this is one of the things that bugs me about store-bought purees. I want to like them because I love convenience, but they're pretty much always just like straight vegetable, straight fruit. Um, whereas the homemade purees in my book all incorporate either butter or olive oil or nuts or coconut or whole milk yogurt um, or heavy whipping cream, something to give fat. And the reason this is so important, besides babies just needing fat, is that it helps the baby absorb the vitamins and minerals that are in the fruits and vegetables. So critical. This is important for adults too. You can't absorb certain vitamins unless there's fat in the meal as well. So please, please, please make sure you're feeding your baby fat with every meal, especially fruit and vegetables. Okay. One thing, I, like I said, I, I actually firmly believe you can pretty much feed young babies anything as long as the texture is correct and they're not going to choke on it, um, whether that means blending it or following baby led weaning guidelines. Um, one thing I do put a little caveat on is grains, um, rice, oats, wheat, corn. It's not that they can't have these foods, but too much of them is going to displace the space for the more nutritious foods. And there's not a lot of nutrition in grains that babies aren't already getting from their breast milk or formula. They're sort of empty filler foods. Um, they do tend to like them. So using them judiciously as like a vehicle for peanut butter or for um, like a fried rice where there's gonna be vegetables mixed in or things like that, um, that, that can work. But you just don't want to fall back on bread, 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 which most kids will happily eat at every meal if you give it to them. Um, it's just it's just going to fill them up without giving them a lot of nutrition. Um, okay, when do we move past purees? So for folks that decided to do mostly purees and not the baby led weaning route, you're probably wondering when, how long do we have to stick with these purees? And the answer is only until about nine months old. It is a little variable from kid to kid. But um, around nine months old, kids learn this. And this very exciting motion is called the pincer grasp. And what that means for feeding is that they can now pick up small pieces of food that are not a choking hazard. Very exciting for parents because this means you don't have to make them anything special at all, really at all. <laughs> um, what you do have to do is cut their food into small pieces so that they don't choke. But because they can pick up small pieces and they're not stuck with this fist grab that younger babies have, you can really feed them anything. And I think this blows parents' minds that a nine-month-old can literally just eat what you eat. You don't have to sit there and feed them. You don't have to. I mean, you should be there because there's always a choking hazard with babies. So you should be at the table. But you could be eating your meal. And you should be. You should eat at the same time 
as your nine month old, your 12 month old, your one year old, um, because that modeling behavior is so critical for teaching kids what meal structure is supposed to look like. Um, you know, chat with them, chat with the other adults at the table. If you're lucky enough to have another adult at the table, um, just treat it like a normal meal so that your kids can learn um, proper eating behaviors and habits. They're not going to be perfect right away. They're going to throw food on the floor. They're going to drop their plates. They're going to spill. Um, but practice makes perfect. And modeling is, is so critical. Um, and like I said, you can feed them anything you're eating. The only things to avoid at nine months are going to be, again, honey, because we're waiting till a year. And then um, choking hazards. So make sure everything is cut really small. And then, um, you know, spicy food. I, I would love if my kids love spicy food. I'm working on it. I think most kids don't. Um, and so, you know, depending on what your family's flavor profiles are like, you may have to kind of peel back the spice level a little bit. Um, but other than that, they can eat what you can eat. Um, okay, so now let's talk one. They turn one, 12 months old. This is a big age because um, this is where a lot of families choose to uh, either wean off of breastfeeding or if they are using formula, this is the time to stop formula. You really don't need it anymore starting at 12 months old. So um, I get a ton of questions about this. I think this is one of the most confusing times for parents. And because of that, um, my book does actually have a very detailed outline of different scenarios that you might have been doing at 11 months old and how to transition that once your child turns 12 months old with regards to the beverages especially. Um, but here's a couple, a couple pointers. First and foremost, we want to switch around 11, 12 months old, really 12, um, to an open cup or a straw cup, no more bottles, okay? Um, that the, the motion that the mouth uses to sip from a bottle is very infantile. And now that your child is getting older and learning to chew and swallow larger chunks of food, that motion is counterproductive. So we need them to be using an open cup or a straw cup. Um, I'm a big fan of that the Munchkin 360 cup because it, it has the same mouth motion as an open cup, but it doesn't spill. Um, so that makes sense for me. Um, so that's one thing you can do around 11 months. I recommend starting to offer water in one of those types of cups, a straw cup or, or an open cup so they can practice. And then around 12 months, we can start offering a milk beverage in that. And I'll go into what that means exactly, but we can start to use that instead of the bottle altogether. Um, I do have tips in my book if you decide to breastfeed longer than a year, that's totally fine and um, great, but you do want to start to time your breastfeeding because the name of the game at one year is food first, okay? From six months to one year old, breast milk and formula are primary nutrition, food is secondary. But that starts to taper as they get a little older and older and you may even see your baby starting to take less formula or breastfeed less often um, or for less time as the food starts to um, take its place. And by 12 months, we want to help that along and we want to start to force food to be the, the main event. Um, so for those who are still breastfeeding, um, I, I recommend doing it after the meal since they come to the meal hungry. And for those that are, we're doing bottles of any kind or that want to stop breastfeeding, my recommendation is a milk, a milk beverage, beverage only at mealtime, not between. Because between meals causes kids to come to the meal not very hungry. And if they're not hungry, there's a really good chance they're going to revolt. And maybe I'll come back out in the future time, non-experts, and talk about toddlers because they're their own breed when it comes to getting good mealtime behaviors out of them. But the first thing you can do with a young toddler, a 12-month-old, a 13-month-old, a 14-month-old, is get rid of the milk and snacks between meals so that they come to the meals hungry and they're willing to eat the food that you're serving. It really works magic. Um, question, we had a question about cow's milk, alternatives to cow's milk, that sort of thing. Um, so one common myth is that kids need milk, um, which is interesting because they don't. If you think about all these milk replacements that have come onto the market, the almond milks, the soy milks, the there's so many of them now. 
those are new. Those when when if you're listening to this when you were a kid, a baby, they probably didn't exist. <laughs> um, and so there was there's always been babies who couldn't have cow's milk, and they and almond milk didn't exist. What happened to those babies? They're fine. Um, they, at, at 12 months old, they don't need 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 cow's milk. Um, I think that most people are probably overfeeding cow's milk um, to begin with. So if you don't have an intolerance or an allergy, my recommendation is no more than four ounces of whole milk cow's milk at two meals, maybe three. Okay. But definitely at the meal with the meal, not before, not after, not between with the meal. Um, and then if they're not tolerating cow's milk, you really, if they were doing formula, this is kind of individual because it depends on what exactly the, the situation is, but you might just wean to water, um, and just expect them to get their calories from food, which they will, they really will. Um, if they're not doing well with milk because of things like constipation, but they still tolerate dairy in general, you can certainly feed yogurt or cheese or cottage cheese. There's ways to get, you know, dairy that's not glasses of milk. Um, so that's one where you might want to work with an individual dietitian. Maybe send me a, a DM on Instagram and I can figure out what exactly your situation is. Um, but don't stress out about it too much because they really – there is no reason they need milk. In fact, I recommend that by 14 months, they be getting no more than four ounces of milk at one or two meals a day. That really is enough. Um, otherwise, water. We want kids to like water and be used to drinking water. I have patients, adult patients, who tell me they don't like the taste of water, and that's devastating information for me because every human being should like the taste of water. That's, that's a survival beverage. <laughs> so, um, that is totally fine to do, to do water. So let's see. Um, I talk about this a lot in the book, but I'm not a big proponent of snacks. I am especially not a big proponent of kids walking around eating snacks, like those little containers with the, the Cheerios. They can just like walk and eat. Um, no, that, that is bad eating behavior for anybody, right? We tell adults, don't eat in the car, don't eat in front of the TV, don't eat mindlessly, but we let kids do it, which is super weird. Um, eating needs to be at a table, partly because it's a choking hazard to eat while walking around or in a stroller or a car seat, but partly because that's the appropriate place to eat and we want to teach kids that. Um, eating should be a formal occasion and that's why I can like, fancy plates and napkins. I'm just saying it should be a, it should be a moment. It should be, now we are sitting down to eat. This is lunch. Um, if you really feel like your kid is starving between meals, then snacks should take place at a table, um, in a high chair, ideally with the whole family having the snack together. Um, you know, so that it's not this like weird, relationship with snacking. Um, and this kind of a mom joke, right? Oh, my kid says they want a snack before dinner. And then during dinner, they say they're not hungry. And then after dinner, they want a snack. Um, you can nip that in the bud, just stop offering snacks. Um, and they'll, they'll bug you for a week and then they'll, they'll realize snacks aren't happening. Um, so yeah, if you feel like you need to do them, that's fine, but do them formally at a table and no more than one snack between meals. Eating five times a day is more than enough. Um, I would really aim for less than that. So um, let's see. And also, if you do snacks, I strongly recommend that they be very bland, unexciting foods. Um, because otherwise, I mean, who doesn't want goldfish? Like they're delicious. They're super salty. They're cheesy. They're addicting. Um, that's not something we eat because we're hungry. We eat goldfish because they taste too good. Um, so if you're going to offer a snack, Things like hard boiled eggs, veggies with hummus, string cheese, plain yogurt, celery with peanut butter, unsalted nuts. Obviously, these have different textures that might be appropriate for different ages, um, but you get the gist. We don't want to offer snack chips that it's just too tasty. All right, so softened foods for younger ones is boiling okay? Um, yeah, that's a great question. So the issue with boiling is you lose a lot of the nutrition into the boiling water, which is sort of a bummer. 
Um, so my, my preferred method for softening foods is crock pots. Um, you know, a little liquid in there with some carrots or some broccoli or what have you essentially steams it in the crock pot, makes it really soft. And then a little bit of liquid will be given off, but then you can use that liquid to thin out your puree. Um, so you'll be reincorporating the nutrients back in. Um, so I have a recipe in my book for crock pot carrots, like baby carrots that turns out really nice and soft. Um, but yeah, I'd prefer that. And to be honest, steaming stuff in the microwave, I know microwaves get a little bit of a bad rap, but you know, we're all busy and they are quick and easy. And if you put like a wet paper towel on top of some like vegetables, um, especially like frozen veggies in the microwave, they'll get nice and steamy. Um, and, and you won't lose all that liquid. So that's a good option. Also, just to talk about frozen vegetables really quick, a lot of the recipes in my book utilize frozen fruits and veggies. Frozen fruits and vegetables are awesome. They have all the nutrition as fresh, sometimes even better if that particular fruit or vegetable is not in season because they're frozen at the peak of freshness. And so they retain a lot of good nutrition. So frozen veggies are awesome. I also would buy for like finger foods around nine months, they sell like a California medley and it's all already cut to like the perfect size. And it's got like carrots and peas and all sorts of stuff. And I would literally, I would throw that in a Tupperware at night, sprinkle on, drizzle on some olive oil, sprinkle on a little bit of seasoning. And then I'd put that in the fridge and by the morning it was thawed out. And that's like easy finger food with some fat and some flavor, no cooking. Um, so yeah, don't, don't hesitate with the frozen foods. Oven baking is awesome. And I'm such a big proponent of getting your kids, um, flavor profiles to be more robust and, uh, oven roasting foods brings out a lot of the natural sweetness, which is great. That's the type of sweetness we want your kids hooked on. Um, you know, and so I love to do, there's a couple recipes in the book, but I love to do like roasted, um, broccoli, roasted carrots, roasted Roasted veggies, roasted squash, um, <laughs> really comes out nice and sweet. Um, you drizzle it with some olive oil before you roast it, or some butter, or some coconut oil, um, and the flavor comes out awesome. And then you can either puree that for younger babies, or for older babies, you can just serve it as is. Yeah, that's a great question. And then for meats, and I'm mostly talking about vegetables. I assume that's more what you're asking about. But oven's also a great way to cook meats um, and fish. Okay, is it true that babies need a higher percentage of carbs? So it depends on your definition of higher. Um, all, most Americans eat a lot of carbs. Um, they do. They definitely need carbs. I'm not putting any babies on a low carb diet or a keto diet or anything crazy like that. Um, they definitely need a lot of carbs. But keep in mind, breast milk and formula it has a lot of carbs. So we're not really at risk for them not getting carbs from that like six months to 12 or six months to 12 month age where they're still getting a lot of breast milk and formula, um, which is why I don't prioritize it in their baby food for those ages. Um, as they turn into like toddlers, one-year-olds, two-year-olds, yeah, they, they need carbs and they'll be happy to eat them. So I don't think you'll have any trouble getting carbs into a one or a two-year-old. Um, but I do recommend variety. So the main sources of carbohydrate in the diet are um, grains, potatoes, fruit, and beans, and, and sugar, which obviously I'm not recommending you give your kids sugar as their main carbohydrate. But as far as grains, potatoes, fruit, and beans, I love to see families, for the whole family, getting a variety there. So not just doing rice, pasta, bread rice, pasta, bread, rice, pasta, bread, because that's just wheat, 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 and rice. It's just grains, 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 grains. So if you can mix in potatoes some nights as your main carbohydrate or um, have fruit as your breakfast carbohydrate in some yogurt or, um, yeah, it's good to have a carbohydrate at every meal. Have beans um, as part of your dinner, you know. So just trying to mix it up so they're getting it from lots of sources and getting a high fiber version of carbohydrates. A lot of kids are dealing with a lot of constipation and I suspect it has to do with two things. One, too much milk, um, which can cause constipation and two, um, too low of a fiber diet. Um, and it's not like I want you giving your kids Metamucil, but 
it's important that they have things like whole wheat products and brown rice and whole fruit, not juice. And, um, you know, potatoes, if you're going to mash them, keep the skin on. Getting, you know, beans are a great source of fiber. So making sure they're getting lots of naturally occurring fiber in their diet. So if you're going to serve carbs, make sure they're fibery carbs. And I think the great thing about, um, you know, feeding your kids this way is, like I said, you're really feeding the family. Um, you're feeding you and the kids are eating what you eat. So this is a, a great strategy for improving the health of the whole family and modeling good behavior um, and hopefully raising kids that are great eaters for years to come with adventurous palates and um, just a healthy relationship with food. I'm, I'm in the minority among dietitians in the smoothie camp, um, probably because I treat so many obese and diabetic adults. Um, I'm not a big proponent of liquid food. Um, it's, it's too easy. It's, it's just it's too easy. Um, it gets kids used to typically very sweet things. Um, you're, you know, you're liquefying fruit most likely. So it's going to have a lot of easy carbs, easy sugar. Um, it's not that fruit's bad, but it takes kids a long time to eat a pile of fruit, but they can suck down a smoothie really fast. Um, so I generally steer people more towards things like smoothie bowls, um, where you're putting all the stuff you would have put in the smoothie into a bowl and letting the kid eat it like that. Um, or you're chopping up all the ingredients you would have put into the smoothie really small and stirring them into yogurt. Um, and so things like oats and flax um, are great. I'm a big proponent of like overnight oats. That might be a good thing to switch to um, is look up some fun recipes for overnight oats. Uh, with a one-year-old, they can self-feed overnight oats. It's totally disgusting and you'll have to put new clothes on them, but they'll do it. They love, love, love them. Because basically it's oats mixed with yogurt and fruit. It's delicious, um, but they're chewing. They're, you know, they're learning to chew. They're learning to feed slowly and eat more mindfully. Um, so I really steer kids and adults alike away from smoothies. I know the temptation is, oh, but I can cram spinach in there. And otherwise my kid won't eat spinach. Your kid doesn't need spinach that bad. <laughs> it's, you know, and if you want to find other ways, try cramming some spinach into a quesadilla or something like that, as opposed to hiding it in a smoothie. I hope to meet some of you soon on my Instagram account. Um, I'll definitely respond to any questions. And uh, thank you guys so much for being here. And non-experts, thank you for having me. I had a great time. Um, have a good night, everybody. Mama,